Hello and welcome to the Spectators Energy Summit, kindly sponsored by National Grid. We're meeting today in um, pretty uncertain times. We're um, we're speaking, of, we're coming to you, streaming to your homes and your offices. Our guests are all remote. The UK has just gone through the sharpest recession in living memory, and it might be about to enter another one with a new lockdown. So everything is up in the air, but even if 2020 had not thrown us this giant COVID curveball, we would still today be discussing the subjects we're discussing right now and the discussion which the Prime Minister has put at the centre of his post-COVID recovery plan, which is how to proceed with the green agenda and the 2050 net zero. There are several questions that might have been answered had the COP26 climate change summit in Glasgow gone ahead. Um, it's been delayed for understandable reasons and so has the government's energy policy. But we're going to have Kwasi Kwarteng, the energy minister, give a keynote address later on today to talk us through some of these issues. The agenda now, um, we're going to be discussing levelling up um, and how far the green agenda fits with levelling up. And of course, levelling up is now a question of reconstruction. How do we rebuild the economy? And how many of the lessons that we've learned in the last few months will help towards that aim? Many of us are been living and working in ways we would never have thought were plausible a few months ago. And I imagine many of you watching this now will basically have adopted new working mechanisms during the lockdown, but kept them throughout the summer because they were working to a surprising extent for a lot of companies. To what extent will these new habits we've learned help accelerate the 2050 agenda? And to what extent might it happen under its own steam, not needing government policy? The energy revolution over the last few months has also continued apace. We've seen incredible fluctuations in the oil market. We've seen the price of oil and drop below zero dollars a barrel at one point. Meanwhile, we've seen the price of wind power drop to levels we never would have thought possible only a few years ago. We've also um, seen Britain emerge as one of the world leaders in wind power with something like a third of all the world's offshore wind farms. So now that we are creating a new industry, is this something that again, which the government needs to stoke or is this something which has now got enough momentum to continue on its own? We have got um, several panels today. At 9.50, we're going to have Quasi Quartine giving us that keynote. At 10.30, we're going to be discussing how the Green Agenda merges with the Leveling Up Agenda, which with Lord Kerslake, who's chair of the UK 2070 Commission, and Ben Hutchin, who's mayor of um, Tees Valley. And lastly, at 11.20, we're going to be asking tough questions about whether green energy really does have the potential to meet the demands of our energy intensive society. We're going to be Lord, joined by Lord Devon, who's chairman of the Climate Change Committee, and Lady Verma, who's former Minister of Energy and Climate Change, along with other experts in the field. But first, I'm delighted to hand over to Nicola Shaw, Executive Director of National Grid and sponsor of today's summit, who will help set the scene for this, today's discussion. Over to you, Nicola. Thanks, Fraser, and thank you everyone for joining us today. As Fraser said, we're all in our homes or likely in our homes and it's a very different world from the one I think we might have expected a year or so ago. Um, but really nice that you've joined us so thank you and I think it will be great to have the conversation today to make sure that the energy sector does play its real part in supporting the recovery. Um, we've got a massively mixed economy, we always have and the discussion that Fraser just went through I think illustrated that very well, the importance of both the public sector and the private sector pulling together in this partnership um, for a future that works for everyone is absolutely key. The national grid is at the backbone of the energy system of the UK. We have, a, we recognise a really important role in enabling this green recovery. We think that means that we need to continue to invest in solutions for decarbonisation um, both for the sector specifically, the energy sector, but also more widely in society, in particular in transport and in heat. We think those things are the leading areas that we need to focus on as we decarbonise. We also know that people are on board with that mission. There's a real support for the net zero agenda across the uh, country. And keeping that with us, um, and as we know that climate change is this defining feature for the generation, 
we must think about the decisions we're taking now and how they're going to influence the future of the planet. Um, otherwise, I think it could become even more significant and hence key. This decade is really key. So what is it this decade that we can do? Well, we can do an enormous amount in terms of magnifying that wind that Fraser had already talk talked about. So maybe up to four times as much wind by 2030 as we're using today to create low carbon electricity. Um, we're going to start installing low heat carbon heating systems in new homes and in existing homes, probably up to about three million homes with low carbon heating by the end of the decade. We will be developing carbon capture and storage systems um, and developing hydrogen networks. And we will be installing about 60,000 charging points so we can power 11 million electric vehicles. UK's leadership in the sector has been enormous um, and we, we talked about our international leadership both in funding and transforming the lower carbon energy system. As we continue through the pandemic and the recession, I think it's an opportunity for us to lead and continue to show that we can do that across the country, not leaving anyone behind. The fairness of this transition is something that has come out to us time and time again in the analysis we've done of what consumers want um, and what voters want. It's important for all of us. So I think there are real opportunities and I'm hoping that this conference will unpack some of that, talk about what it would mean locally, what it would mean nationally, what it means for um, business and what it means from government. I think all of those are important. Um, things we can do now, accelerating and really leveraging on the work on electric vehicles. It's evident that that change is coming in the next few years. Really building on uh, the zero carbon industrial clusters that are being developed. Um, the Humber and Teesside is one, and I know you'll talk about that later. Economic opportunities from offshore wind. Um, I said that there'll be growth of about four times in the next decade. But by 2050, that's about 75 gigawatts of wind, about a seven or eight times growth from where we are now. And then there will be more interconnectors, more interconnectors between us and Europe, bringing further clean energy into the country and making sure it's easier to balance the system at all times, which is vital for security of supply. And then I think we'll see lots of change in the area of hydrogen. There are lots of um, schemes and development projects underway at the moment and those will really come to fruition over this next 10 years. And National Grid is at the heart of each of those things. I look forward to talking to you further, seeing what government's going to do to unleash them. Back to you now to get the discussion underway. Thank you again for hosting this important set of discussions. Thank you, Nicola. Now let's move swiftly on to our first panel this morning, which will look at how and indeed um, whether the UK's climate ambitions are compatible with our economic recovery from COVID. Now, back in the spring, the UK experienced its sharpest economic contraction for 300 years. Hopes for a V-shaped recovery, which were being articulated by the Andy Haldane, the chief economist of the Bank of England, only a few weeks ago, are now waning pretty fast. So we've had circuit breakers, fire breakers, and lockdowns forcing businesses to close their doors again, and people are heading back home. The latest um, shape of economic recovery we saw yesterday wasn't a V, it was a W, forcing some very hard questions about how we're going to pay for this and how government needs to prioritize itself. Now, we know that the, Cl the Clim UK Climate Change Committee has calculated that this will cost about 1% of UK GDP. That's between 20 and 40 billion pounds a year, potentially, making it one of the most expensive promises the government is making in the post-COVID um, world. So is it still affordable? To what extent have the changes we've seen in society, the stunning economic contraction, shown that it might not be as ex expensive as people had originally thought? Or is this going to be something where the government will look back on in later years as a rather lavish promise made in the days where they could afford more expensive promises than they were going to be able to keep in the post-COVID world? The government's due to um, unveil plans for a new state-backed green bank that will finance the climate ambitions. And the Chancellor has unveiled something like £2 billion grant scheme to insulate homes that will provide those green jobs and improve energy efficiency. So is economic growth compatible with sustainable development? I'm delighted to be joined in the next panel by Bim Nafalami, who's chair of the All Party Group of Renewable and Sustainable Energy. 
by John Sovin, who's the Executive Director of Greenpeace, by Polly Billington, Director of UK 100, and by Graeme Cooper, who's Project Director of National Grid. We're all going to make some opening remarks. We're going to open it up then for a general discussion, but we'll also be taking questions from you. So please do send them using the magical powers of Zoom communications. Um, so let's start. So if I can ask you, Bim, who's a, I see you're in our spectator offices there in Westminster. Um, please take it away. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Quite simply, I believe that economic recovery is is compatible with, with a sustainable future. And there are two main reasons for that. The first is we don't really have a choice because climate change is coming upon us. Uh, and this government uh, over the last 10 years has, 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 has done, broadly speaking, the right things, but we're gonna have to continue doing that and intensify that. What does that look like in terms of sustainability though? What are the actions we actually need to take? I'd look at two principal areas, energy, transformation and the financing of it. In relation to energy transformation, we are gonna to have to significantly upgrade and increase the amount of investment that goes into renewable energy, nuclear energy, things like electric cars that, that Ms. Shaw from, from National Grid mentioned. But those things are not just policy things, they're not just statements, they will require cash. Now, cash can come from one of two sources. The first is the private sector, the other is the public sector. The private sector, we need to make the regulatory changes in order to get more private sector funds in to do that. But at the same time, we are going to have to increase our public sector spending in that and not be shy of that and use that as a lever to help levelling up in big parts of this country. In particular, when I think of nuclear energy, where, there, where nuclear energy is, um, where, where it tends to be situated, places like Cumbria, uh, the coastal areas, um, where there's a big need for levelling up, renewable energy, which frankly is, is almost all parts of the country and indeed offshore. Um, but it's not just economic recovery in terms of levelling up, it's also how do we use our strengths in the services sector, financial services sector, to help finance that, bring that private sector funding in, and to help expand and export those technologies to other parts of the world. And so I can see that sort of uniting between uh, re rewiring our industrial heartlands with using our service sector strength. And those two things combined, I think, look like a good economic recovery to me. Thanks very much, Bim. Now I'd like to pass over to John Sovin, the Executive Director of Greenpeace. Um, uh, thank you. And I just wanted to pick up actually uh, a couple of points made by Bim and Fraser in your introduction. I mean, I think, first of all, Fraser, you're right, in terms of the world has changed dramatically as a result of COVID, but it's also been change, changing dramatically if you look over the last uh, decade since the 2008 financial crisis, because if you look then, when we built back after that financial crisis, a lot of it was in high polluting industries and what happened was CO2 emissions dramatically went up after that financial crisis uh, was over. But the but when you look at, for example, the Smith School at Oxford University, who did a study on all the packages that were done after the financial crisis, they found that the green packages were much more economically uh, viable in terms of providing jobs and recovery and so on. So there were lessons to be learned from that. But I think also if you fast forward uh, just over a decade, you also find that renewable energy, the price of renewable energy in the last decade has collapsed, as you rightly said, in terms of uh, offshore wind, onshore wind, solar. The price of batteries has dropped 90% uh, in the last 10 years. Oil company share prices have collapsed more than 50%. Renewable energy companies now in terms of uh, market capitalization are now ahead of some of the biggest oil companies in the world. So, the, so the, the whole landscape is so dramatically different today than 10 years ago. And I think that that gives us huge cause for optimism when you look at going forward here in terms of fiscal stimulus or government support, because it's, it's not really money particularly we're talking about here. What we're really talking about here is proper government regulation and policies that will provide a framework for private investors uh, to actually invest. And they just need certainty. That's probably the most important thing uh, 
that is required because, for example, the offshore wind industry will require 50 billion pounds worth of investment over the coming decade. So getting the right regulatory environment for the offshore wind industry is really critical. And that's a government issue. It's not money. They need to sort out things like the grid infrastructure, like the issues around environmental protections. Um, issues around, you know, Crown Estate, dealing with the MOD and the Civil Aviation Authority over radar. These are all challenges which the government needs to sort out. And if they don't, then there won't be a successful offshore wind industry. They will not meet their 40 gigawatt target, but it's not money. And I think that the same thing when you look at, for example, electric vehicles, we just need the government to announce that there will be a phase out date for the internal combustion engine by 2030. And the price of electric vehicles is dropping dramatically as the price of batteries drops dramatically. And I would say the same with energy efficiency. The government has had lots of programs on energy efficiency and the Chancellor, we welcomed, announced the new package in terms of fiscal stimulus for, for energy efficiency, but it was quite short term. And the government really needs to think long term. And that's really the last point I wanted to make. We've got six parliaments to 2050. They need a plan working back over those six parliaments. There is cross-party support for this. There's broad support out there in the country, but they need a plan working back from that. And in particularly, the next decade is absolutely critical in terms of actually trying to, as far as we can to halve global emissions by 2030, if we want to keep to within a two degree or less than two degree rise in global average temperatures. So what we do in the coming decade is so important and that's obviously why getting countries globally to agree to much more ambitious plans ahead of the Glasgow summit uh, is really critical and that I think is also showing quite positive signs in terms of the UK government was the first economy to announce a 2050 net zero now followed by China 2060, South Korea 2050, Japan 2050, if Biden wins tomorrow he'll announce 2050. You know this is now a, a, a much more collective global effort by major powers, which we haven't seen happen in the last four or five years. John, thanks very much indeed. Um, now I'd like to pass over to Graham Cooper, who's Project Director of National Grid. Hi, thank you, Fraser, and uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm, I, I won't repeat the, the great message of Bill and John. Um, I guess the important thing from a National Grid perspective is we've talked about the growth opportunity in offshore wind. We've talked about the downstream decarbonisation of transport, so cars and decarbonisation of heat. National Grid is really the critical element that joins the two together. So ultimately where that clean energy is generated and how it gets to where it needs to be consumed is critical to, to success. You, you need to look at the whole system. So from National Grid's perspective, um, you know, the grid is happy and able to cope with this transition uh, as long as we are in a position where we are able to have strategic investment ahead of need, you know, coming back to the plan that, uh, you know, having a, a plan that John articulated, um, you know, the grid has generally uh, been regulated in a way to react to a mature market. What we're seeing here is almost creation of new markets. So decarbonisation of transport, decarbonisation of heat, large scale offshore wind. We've coped with the, the changes so far and we will cope with the changes going forward. But having a regulation that regulates for net zero rather than regulate for the short term will actually give that confidence that John spoke about to allow the market and to allow all the investment that's needed. The, I guess the other linking to this is if you read the Commission on Climate Change uh, you know, report on net zero, we're going to need four times the amount of renewables than we have today. And that is going to need to facilitate a grid that's twice as big as we have today. And that drives a tremendous amount of jobs. So our own analysis uh, seems to, to indicate that we're going to need roughly 400,000 jobs in the net zero economy between now and 2050. I'd also point out that in your classical business model and, and, and in your business model and business studies, how do you recover from a recession? One of the best things you can do in a recession is invest in the infrastructure. Yes, it is a cost now, but we will reap the benefits for uh, very, very many years. The infrastructure that National Grid deploys today will be operational in net zero. Our kit lasts broadly 40 years. And therefore, 
having the right stimulus to get the right energy networks in the right place at the right time ahead of need and to be future proof has to actually be the foundation stone um, of, of the green recovery and allowing us to be on a trajectory to net zero. So I'll stop at that point and hand back to you, Fraser. Thanks very much, Graham. <clears throat> now I'd like to bring in um, Polly Billington, who's director of UK 100. Uh, thanks very much, Fraser. And um, it's lovely to be on a panel where there is uh, arguably so much violent agreement. Um, UK 100 is a network of local leaders committed to 100% clean energy by 2050. And in fact, we're upping our ambition to uh, the upping our commitment uh, collectively as a group because so many of our members have already made more ambitious commitments than that over the past couple of years. Because to answer briefly the question that has been posed, can we have uh, an economic recovery and is it compatible with um, our, our net zero ambitions, we can't do it without it. This is ultimately an opportunity to learn the mistakes of, of uh, the past that John Sovan pointed out, that actually you can have more labour intensive and more job creation in green industries than you can in some of the uh, more, more polluting ones. And that, that's a lesson from the past. We know that's the, the case now. And also it goes to issues of place because um, I, um, it's great to talk about that offshore wind story and that offshore wind story is one of actually political consensus over more than 10 years. That vision was first outlined before 2010. It was broadly implemented between 2010 and 2015, and, as an, and we're now reaping the benefits so that 47% of our electricity was uh, renewable on the grid um, in the first quarter of 2020. Now, when we were talking about that kind of thing before 2010, uh, many people thought it would be impossible and that we were throwing good money after bad. However, that's great, but you cannot decarbonize the whole community, the whole, uh, whole of the country, by simply doing it all offshore. It actually has to happen in places. And that goes to not only Graham's point about the importance of decarbonizing heat and transport, because those things happen in places, it also goes to an economic desire to be able to rebalance our economy across the country. Now, our local leaders know that. They know that there is an opportunity for jobs. And it was interesting, Graham mentioned the idea of maybe 500,000 jobs in order to be able to meet net zero. We've identified 500,000 jobs just to do the retrofit green van work that needs to be done in the next 10 years or so um, with, our, with an, our analysis that we did with LSE Grantham Institute. So the opportunity to be able to turn what the government has done initially with something like the Green Homes Grant into a long-term transformation of the fabric of our country, not only the, fa the fabric of our country and the, the homes and the buildings that we live, but also the economic regeneration that would create is really exciting. And that's just the retrofit bit. If you think about the amount of people who are uh, who in the construction industry who are on furlough, who could be re, um, retrained and reskilled and redirected towards that kind of work, it could be transformative. It's not straightforward, but it is a, an indication of what needs to happen. And of course, those jobs don't get concentrated in places where there already is or is traditionally a certain amount of wealth. It has to happen everywhere. But one other point on the issue of place, which I think is important, is that we, um, John mentioned the issue of the phase out of uh, electric vehicles. We know one of the greatest anxieties that people have um, is not only about the price of electric vehicles, but whether they're going to be able to charge them. Now, you can, you can send a strong regulatory message to the market by phasing out the vehicles, and, and that's very much supported by our members. But also what they want to see is a seamless EV infrastructure. Again, what does that require? It requires jobs and it requires jobs everywhere. One more point on that issue to do with capacity, um, because a lot of people will say, oh, the, gr the grid's not big enough, it can't cope with it. And Graham is right to talk about the fact that it needs to be renewed. And it's one of the asks of our task force, our resilient recovery task force, which said, if there's going to be a comprehensive spending review ever, hopefully when there is one, one of the key things we need to do is to re invest in renewing the grid in order to be able to have it to be a decentralised and decarbonised one. Now, in 2026, the National Grid will celebrate 100 years of existence. It was, uh, it was, an it was something that was uh, introduced in a period of recession under a Conservative Prime Minister at a time when people really didn't know whether those kind of things could happen. And yet somebody had the guts to do something really big and say that electricity was something that everyone should have access to. And it grew out of local electricity companies. 
we don't know really or nobody's explained a proper vision of what a future nat national grid should look like that would be able to meet the needs and of the future of this country and graham's totally right um being able to invest in ahead of need is absolutely what our members want because without it they won't be able to transform their com their their communities in the way that they've committed to so when we think about capacity and we worry about our energy intensive industries and decarbonizing them Think also of those deindustrialized places. Those places are desperate for leveling up and where there is actually capacity on the grid. And we could be doing something really transformative about our industries and particularly about decarbonizing in those places. Thank you, Polly. Well, um, you, you pointed out there's violent agreement on this panel. So let's try to change that uh, a little bit. Uh, I was quite taken, John Sobin, by your point that what the industry needs now isn't so much money, it's certainty. Now, this is quite a departure. Typically, people characterize the green debate as being, okay, let's move to a green future. But by the way, these things aren't economically sustainable, so it needs masses of subsidy from the government. Now, this calculation changes when we see the, the recent auctions for green energy coming in at way less than, for example, the Hinkley Point strike price that was agreed under George Osborne. Um, you, you talk about the way that um, the batteries have fallen by 90% in, in, in cost as well. So the economics of this seem to be um, coming on pretty nicely without government subsidy. So can you say a bit more about regulation? Because I'd like to contrast this with Polly, because you mentioned, Polly, um, investment ahead of need. I'm assuming the investment you're referring to is investment from, from the government. But, but John, first, can you just say a little bit more about your point about how certainty is more important at the moment than subsidy? Yes, well, I suppose, yeah, you don't often get to, to uh, um, uh, you know, to have such a win-win situation, uh, I suppose. But, but I think that the, the key thing here is, and I think Polly alluded to this, is that if you go back, uh, not that many years, actually, five or ten years, the price of offshore wind was the most expensive power uh, in the UK. And actually, there was fierce criticism uh, at the amount of money the government was subsidising offshore wind power at. And But of course, today, you could actually get into a situation, uh, well, it's definitely subsidy free, I would say. Um, and, and so I think that we're seeing this across the board with, with many different uh, technologies. And um, this is partly because of the role of China, uh, because they've mass produced many things uh, and e even become a world leader in many of these areas, whether it's EV or, 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 or electric vehicles or batteries or various different kinds of renewable energy, particular solar panels. So, I mean, they have mass produced the technology that has very often been developed in the West. Uh, but they've commercialized it on a, on a massive and global scale and driven the cost down. So I think that the question now is, is this regulatory framework in which you want to attract private investors? And I think we have, in general, reached a relatively sweet spot when it comes to this. And I agree there is a check, chicken and egg situation. Like, if you don't have charging points, people won't buy electric vehicles. So the charging infrastructure has to go in. And then you said the private investors say, well, I'm not paying for a, a charging infrastructure to go in if nobody's gonna buy electric vehicles. But if the government then says, well, actually we're going to phase out electric vehicles and actually we're going to ban them from 2030 onwards. Well, private investors then know that the take up of electric vehicles is gonna be, I think, um, let's see, National Grid was 11 million electric vehicles by 2030. So there is a, a, a massive market here, which the government is almost guaranteeing by regulation, uh, not by money. And I think that this applies to a whole suite of things where the right framework and the right regulation would actually go a long way. And I say this just one key example is because I think the, the point Polly was making about this was really critical in terms of energy efficiency. We have 26 million homes here which need upgrading in terms of energy efficiency and many other buildings besides. The, the Chancellor announced an energy efficiency program in the budget, but to begin with, it was only to last six months. And I think that that's my point. It takes more than six months to build the supply chain, skill and retrain people, you know, set up an apprenticeship program and so on and so forth. If they looked at this in terms of what do we want to do between now and 2030, Here's the regulatory framework. 
we're going to guarantee this is going to happen. It would have cross-party support. There's a lot of people say, oh, well, you might have a new parliament in, in, in four years' time. But the Labour Party and all the other parties support action on climate change to the same or a higher degree. So, this, so there could be a huge degree of uh, political certainty and regulatory certainty, which I think would then help private investment uh, deliver what needs to be done. Um, thanks, John. Um, Bim, can I take you um, in here? It's um, quite interesting here that, 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 sure, everybody says they want certainty, but I'm wondering if you think in the current circumstances when, you know, certainty seems to be the last thing that anybody is able to come up with, but, but can you, I'm wondering how you see the recent uh, upheavals, what we've been through as a country in the last six to eight months, what way do you think it's, it's changed the calculations? Uh, do you think it's harder for government now to offer certainty over the rest of his decade? Or do you think that what we've seen in the last few months has un un underlined the need for change? I think that there will be a temptation amongst some in government to see this as, look, this is all a bit too difficult at the moment. You know, God make me good, but not yet. We've just got to get through the next you know, the next few months or, or year or so. I think that, so, so you're right that some people may think that. I actually think this is when we need to do precisely the opposite, be bolder. Um, what, what does that look like? I think that looks like in political terms, and, you know, I suppose I should bring the politics to this. You know, we have a lot of areas that are voted Conservative for the first time that are, a big number of their jobs are in carbon intensive industries. Now, if we postpone the action that I think everybody has agreed that, that, that we want to take, that makes it harder in the medium term for us to deal with that, those problems, not easier. So I think that we've actually, if we, you know, if we, if we want to try and hold these areas for a sustained period of time, we're going to have to act now uh, in order to deal with that. So I think that that's something we need to do. And secondly, and this is something that, you know, I, I keep thinking, you know, if the Chancellor was here or one of his team was here, what would they be saying? And they'd probably be screaming debt and taxes at the moment. And they'd be saying, you're talking about spending all this money. How are we going to pay for it? And I think we need to start having a serious conversation about increasing taxes. And it's very odd for me as a conservative and a fiscal conservative to talk about increasing taxes, increasing taxes on carbon intensive damaging activities luring them on you know, good things, so to speak, in climate terms, to help, first of all, in the short term, raise revenue, but then in the second term, to help accelerate the changes that we need to have and accelerate it without huge public subsidy, but through the private sector reallocating its capital and indeed people reallocating their labour to where the jobs are. So that's in economic terms what I think we need to do. We need to start having those tough conversations around tax in particular. Thanks for that, Bim. So, um, Graeme Cooper, can I bring you in here? You came up with a phrase that Polly also used, strategic investment ahead of need. Um, I'm, I probably should know what that means, but I don't. Can you <laughs> just say a little bit more about, about what you're referring to? It sounds like a euphemism. Yeah, yeah. so no, I'll try, try and make it really, really simple. So um, before I joined National Grid, I, I was a wind farmer. So I worked for a business that developed half a billion pounds of the wind. So what you ended up having to do as a wind farmer is start to develop your wind farm, apply for a grid connection, and you'd wait a long time for the grid to get to you. If you're looking at a world where time now is currently our biggest enemy, actually putting the right grid infrastructure in the right locations so that you're not waiting for the grid and, and therefore investment ahead of need is the right thing to do. Are you, let's use a, a really nice simple example. So we talked about um, briefly uh, the, the transition to um, decarbonizing transport. So the challenge around decarbonizing transport is actually one of confidence. What you need is the confidence that your first and only car can be electric, that you can drive further than the range of the car, and that wherever you go, you will find that charging is not a barrier to your journey. So that needs some you know, big government sort of uh, strategy that says confidence is the critical one here have evenly spaced charging across the motorway network, which is what the uh, Office of Low Emission Vehicles is, is working up now, um, deploy the grid infrastructure for the and then the future cars, vans, trucks, buses and coaches that are coming between you know, now and 2035. And then the charge point infrastructure can plug into that in a scalable way. So you do it right, do it once. 
And that needs that, that infrastructure deployment first to de-risk that market to allow those charge points to go in, in in time. So it's actually one of confidence. So if you see the right infrastructure being in the right place, then you can then make, you know, private enterprise can make plans to then act upon that. The other thing I think we've also found is um, being a price regulated monopoly, national grid is obviously rightly scrutinized by our regulator. So we are you know, measured about delivering the perfect um, and we're penalized if we don't deliver the perfect. The challenge we've got in the world we're moving into is the market is moving very, very quickly into decarbonizing heat and transport and growth in offshore wind. So what we actually need to do is not wait for the perfect. What we need to do is get going now on the good, you know, the least regrets rather than trying to dial out the perfect. And so that needs that forward vision um, and forward regulation. And up until now, we've had a regulator done a really, really good job of regulating for today. But actually what we need is regulation to regulate for net zero, because then you might make different longer term value judgments. Thanks, Graham. I'm now going to go to a question from one of our viewers. Gordon Taylor um, puts this question to you, Polly. If the future envisaged by the panelists comes to pass, how much will the average person's energy bills increase by? Well, that sort of goes to the to what Graham said. It sort of it really does depend on the regulator, and it goes to Bim's point about where taxes fall. At the moment, most of the decarbonisation burden actually goes on your electricity bill, so you're paying more for your cleaner electricity, your your, your cleaner um, power. You don't have that the same level of burden on your gas bill. Now, seventy percent of people. Um, who are in fuel poverty rely on gas for, to heat their homes. So if I was to say, yes, we must shift the, the, the burden of, um, of carbon from electricity to gas, we'd create lots more people um, in fuel poverty without creating, um, which, wouldn't, which wouldn't be desirable. But we do have to think about why would the price of electricity is higher, even though it's now cleaner than, uh, than gas. And if we're talking about decarbonizing heat, we're gonna have to be able to reposition those things to encourage and incentivize people to use cleaner heat than we currently do on gas. So I don't have a number, um, that number, and, and when there are those numbers modeled, they change quite a lot. And it really does depend on what the regulator decides. What's been problematic, as it goes to Graham's point, is that Ofgem is always focused on the price now rather than the price in the future. And ultimately, while doing that, is setting up problems for the prices for the future and the cost for the future. Because if you only um, worry about the price now, you actually make it more expensive in the future. And there are lots of low regrets options that could be incentivized in the next 10 years and need to be if we're going to meet the science. Um, thanks, Paul. Yeah. Phrase, and phrase, phrase, sorry, yes. just on, on yeah. that point. This is so critically important. I mean, Graham could speak with much more expertise than, than me on this. But e even if you take the offshore wind industry, which is trumpeted as a huge success, the grid connections coming on shore from offshore wind farms are very expensive uh, because it's not thought about strategically and it's not thought about in terms of the future system where you need less connections. It would be far cheaper to think about this in a strategic sense and people's bills would be reduced as a result of that. And this is a real failure of Ofgem and the government actually not to provide a proper regulatory regime for the grid and, and as has been said this is really important for all other areas this is this is this infrastructure we need to get right and at the moment it's not so i'd like to try to come in on there because yeah, the, yeah, sure. the one thing that's very very useful actually at the point uh, john is i think uh certainly bays get this they've just formed a working group to actually look at coordinated grid you know shared infrastructure in the sea um, and that's a really good thing to do I guess the thing from my perspective is that power also needs to land onshore. And so it, the offshore coordination needs to consider everything in the round. So not just the offshore wind farm interconnection, bootstraps, how it arrives on the beach, but also how it's then moved around the country. Um, my concern from that perspective is, is that's going to take some time. I come back to my point that there are, you know, planning applications need to go in now for infrastructure that's going to be delivered in 2028. And any delay now in deciding what the perfect may be pushes that timeline further and further towards 2030. So I think there's an, there's an interesting trade-off here. The government needs to 
look at those coordinations to, to make better decisions. But we can't try and wait to engineer the perfect to be getting on with what's just good now. And it's the management of that transition is actually where there's some real opportunity to, to, to understand the value of time and the, the, the doing the right things in the right order. But I think there is a recognition we just need to move faster would be my, my view. Sure, I'm with you, Graham. I have to, I have to say, it's, it's quite cheery hearing you talk about a choice between the perfect and the good in times like these, where either seems quite a long way off. Uh, but the next question from Susan Carey, and it's to you, Bim. Um, what's happened to the nuclear energy that the Conservatives used to be so keen on? How will, what role will that play in getting to net zero? Or is it the case that developments in renewables, especially the price of wind power, have now moved on so much that we can now see the Hinkley Point deal as the decisions of yesteryear that simply didn't envisage how prices would collapse so much in renewable energy and how reliable renew renewable energy would become? It's a good question. I think it was a decision of yesteryear, but I also think it needs to be a, a decision of today and one of tomorrow. And I strongly support the government reinvesting in nuclear power. I think it's absolutely critical. There needs to be a good mix of energy. We've talked about onshore and offshore wind. That's, I think everybody agrees we need that. And yes, the, the, the cost of it has, has, has dropped significantly. But one of the reasons why the cost of nuclear has historically been a bit high is because of the constant regulatory changes. And we need to think of a new financing model for nuclear. So yes, we need to get the cost of nuclear down. But I don't see in the next 10, 15 years with the amount of sort of fossil fuel energy coming off stream, I don't see us, us really being able to generate the amount of energy that we need without at least one, but possibly even two or three nuclear power stations coming on stream. And I strongly support it from just simply generating enough energy. And um, when I have this debate with people in the industry, some people don't like the term baseload energy, uh, but I think it is an important concept to make sure that we do just structurally increase that reliable, constant level of energy that nuclear can provide. So I, I strongly support it. And I think on the conservative benches, there's a there's a preponderance of support of it. And I think we need to do it as make that decision as soon as possible. John Sullivan, what's your take on, on nuclear energy? Do you have reservations? Well, no, I, I'm always just surprised that the uh, 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 conservative uh, government supporting the French and Chinese governments, because you have to remember nuclear power stations are only built by the state. Uh, and in, in, in the UK sense, they're only built by the Chinese state and the Chinese Communist Party and the French state, the only DF. Uh, and they can only be built with government support, government subsidy, uh, government ownership, which is what the UK government's discussing at the moment. So I do find this a bit weird, uh, frankly, uh, their love of um, a technology that is so state controlled and has huge security implications. I also think the world's changing. Look, offshore wind is a bit like base load power. Um, it, the wind out at sea blows pretty much fairly constantly all the time. And of course, when you get to floating offshore winds, uh, uh, wind power stations, which will be further out, you'll get even, even more wind. And then you've also got hydrogen and you've got green hydrogen. You've got actually a storage mechanism coming along. Uh, with the with the again the drop in the price of electrolyzers and so on, so I think that you can actually design a smart energy system around energy efficiency, solar, wind, geothermal, other renewable technologies linked with interconnectors going into Europe. A future that's also going to be hydrogen is also going to be critically important. So I think it's possible to envisage a different kind of uh, a future, and then of course you've also got. You know, other people would say, well, we need carbon capture and storage. I don't think you need all, I don't think you need nuclear carbon capture and storage and renewable energy and green hydrogen and all the other things that go with it. I think some choices need to be made and nuclear is probably the most expensive of all of them. Well, John, thanks very much. And now that's it for our first EMS panel of the morning. For our next one, we've got Kwasi Kwarteng, the energy minister, giving us his keynote speech. Now, um, I, I, in my mind, I like to think of us all in being a whole, and I would ask you to put your hands together to thank our panel. So 
Um, let's do it virtually. Bim, Graham, John, and Polly, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. And to those of you watching at home, let's, um, let's go to Quasi Quartang via the Spectator TV website. Thanks very much.